Okay, when we try to understand uh, competition, rivalry, and even friendship in the 21st century, sorry, can we take anything useful from the ancient proverb, my enemy's enemy is my friend? The answer might be yes, at least for how we try to understand the typical psychology of male uh, group formation. When species engage in aggressive confrontation, they risk a lot. They risk losing the resources or territory that they already have, and they risk their own physical well-being. An animal not equipped with the mental tools to assess fighting ability uh, quickly would likely risk uh, dying out or coming to serious harm. Uh, learning through trial and error about someone else's fighting ability relative to your own is not very useful from a Darwinian point of view. Different species might assess fighting ability uh, from visual cues or, or uh, pieces of information. Uh, for example, um, in certain species of uh, primates, uh, dominance rank is associated with traits uh, that are shaped by uh, testosterone levels. Here, within the male mandrill, um, the uh, most dominant male mandrill within the pack has the brightest red flash along its nose region. In humans too, there are also obvious costs in not being able to assess uh, fighting ability uh, quickly and rapidly. For example, with their body size, um, the ability to inflict a costly blow in a fight increases with body size to a much greater extent than the ability to resist that blow um, increases with body size. Regardless of, of whether or not uh, we're judging men or women in laboratory experiments, uh, masculine physical characteristics uh, such as uh, uh, low voice pitch and harder looking facial features um, and more muscular bodies are judged as relatively more dominant uh, than feminine physical characteristics are. Uh, so uh, softer looking facial features, raised voice pitch, less muscular, uh, leaner, uh, slightly leaner bodies. And we know this from experiments that manipulate uh, masculine physical characteristics using computer graphic methods um, or other forms of computer technology, for example, to alter uh, pitch in voices. It makes sense that we still evaluate uh, dominance in this way, even at a time uh, where harm from violence is an unprecedented um, historical low on average. Um, if from the point of view of our own well-being, that one in a thousand time where we mistakenly underestimate a rival's dominance it is, all, is all that matters. We might stereotype others on the dominance trait dimension from um, minimal information. We might make these uh, first impression judgments uh, because being proven wrong about someone's dominance in the long run is a small price to pay uh, in comparison to not perhaps stereotyping others in this way and then finding out that your judgment turned, to be, uh, turned out to be misguided. So from the point of view of dominance, the speed of uh, social judgments on this dimension might be much more important than the accuracy of social judgments on this dimension. But for dominance judgments to be uh, useful, they also need to be flexible, they also need to change in light of recent experience, for example. Um, here, when we ask men uh, to judge dominance from uh, masculine versions of men's faces compared to uh, feminine versions of the same um, individual, uh, men's dominance judgments um, alter in light of recent experience. Uh, simply um, imagining an aggressive confrontation with a male rival is enough to shape uh, men's dominance judgments from facial features alone. Uh, men who imagine having been victorious in, a, in an aggressive confrontation with a male rival are relatively less likely uh, to associate facial masculinity uh, with high dominance. Men who imagine having um, lost an aggressive confrontation with a male rival um, are relatively more cautious, more likely to associate facial masculinity with high dominance. So how dominant you might feel at a given moment in time might shape how you judge dominance in others, just from minimal information such as facial features alone. Dominant people might typically get their way over others because the threat that we think they pose to us is much more immediate um, in nature. Uh, luckily, um, intelligence, the ability to make long-term plans for the future and to um, use mental simulation and foresight in order to simulate what might happen in the future 
and might have helped humans uh, get round this um, problem of navigating uh, social dominance hierarchies successfully. And this still might be relevant to, to human behaviour perhaps today. One form of social intelligence in humans that we tend to take for granted is this ability to manage our social networks and form alliances with, uh, alliances with individuals, uh, individuals who we might consider uh, to be uh, uh, we consider to be close to them on an emotional level, uh, such as friends, but also alliances with individuals who might be more um, instrumental in helping us to achieve our goals because uh, we associate them with having um, traits or skills that we particularly uh, value. Alliance formation might have been particularly important on average for men um, over human evolutionary history. Excuse me. Um, fossil record evidence suggests that um, aggressive conflict contributed to a large proportion of mortalities in ancestral societies. This, in turn, uh, was, is thought to have placed a benefit on male groups of large size in ancestral societies um, who were cooperative enough and cohesive enough that they could outcompete rival groups. Uh, from this point of view, uh, the behaviours that um, are related to warfare and the psychology of warfare uh, may have developed in humans alongside uh, the psychology of cooperation. And we can perhaps think of these things, perhaps counterintuitively, uh, cooperation and conflict as going um, hand in hand. When we look at uh, the psychology of how groups are formed, um, <coughs> kept together, and how they might disband. Oops. Uh, perhaps surprisingly, um, humour can provide a window into these issues of cooperation and conflict in humans. Humour is an incredibly diverse form of social intelligence in humans. We all know there are individual and cultural differences um, in humour styles, um, and also individual and cultural differences in, in methods of delivery of a set of jokes. But while we tend to think of ourselves as laughing at people who tell jokes, uh, we also laugh with people who tell jokes. Experimental work suggests that humour plays an important role um, in group cohesion. And this sort of raises the question of why um, humans have humour in the first place, um, in contrast to other species uh, that may have laughter, um, their own form of laughter, but don't have such an in intricately, uh, intricately developed uh, system of humour. Some researchers have suggested that humour might serve a purpose in humans. We might produce humour to let other people know um, indirectly rather than explicitly that we want to start or keep a friendship with them. And we might appreciate other people's humour, again, to let others know indirectly rather than explicitly uh, that that feeling, is, that feeling is mutual. So humour might play an important role in group cohesion for these reasons. Um, our recent work uh, suggests that humour might be shaped by the characteristics of the joke teller and the person listening to the joke. It's not just um, who's delivering the joke, or sorry, who's listening to the joke, it's, it's the way um, he tells that joke. And this data seemed to be specific to uh, men's judgments of other men. When we take various different measures in the lab of men's social and physical dominance, so how dominant they look um, and how dominant they report being in their day-to-day -day lives, uh, dominant men have a stronger preference for jokes delivered by other men in low voice pitch compared to raised voice pitch. Um, again, voice pitch, a, a possible measure of men's own dominance. So what this suggests is that dominant guys um, have a stronger preference for uh, jokes delivered by dominant sounding men. When we try to tease apart this relationship and whether or not these findings just reflect uh, sort of self-serving biases for people um, who might sound similar to, to themselves, uh, jokes seem to play a special role here. When we ask men to judge other men's uh, friendship potential uh, from men telling jokes compared to men uh, reading just neutral um, speech, uh, neutral statements, uh, dominant men have a stronger preference for dominant sounding guys who tell, uh, as friends who tell jokes, but the relationship isn't apparent when men are judging other men just delivering a uh, neutral content. From the point of view of what this might mean, a 
dominant individual um, telling a joke might be judged to be uh, unconsciously uh, particularly of value if it suggests that a um, formidable person is uh, willing to become friends with you or, or, or stay friends with you. A guy who sounds as if he might be high, um, high status. It's also consistent with this idea that birds of a feather really might uh, flock together when we look at social network formation. Uh, recent work suggests that a similarity between social partners is important, both in how social networks are formed in the first place and how they're kept together. Um, evidence across uh, different species, cultures and developmental stages suggests that this might be the case. One modern um, social network that we can look at is the business organisation. Um, here, for example, um, successful businesses have individuals who are cooperating uh, toward a common goal, which is usually the, the success of that team or business relative to rival groups. Work suggests that um, individuals might unconsciously prefer dominant-looking leaders, um, dominant-looking individuals as leaders. This might be the case um, if human evolution favoured what's termed a parochial altruists. So those individuals who are cooperative in that they could lead uh, their group as a team for some kind of greater good, but they direct their dominance or hostility toward out groups or, or rival groups. Uh, we examine this idea and um, preference uh, for certain um, certain types of physical appearance in, in uh, leaders by looking at um, pay awards of imaginary employees of uh, the retail industry within a lab experiment. Here we asked individuals to rate um, men and women, um, to award pay to men and women in a lab-based task um, based on photographs of their face alone. Um, unbeknown to our participants, these faces had already been rated for how dominant, attractive and trustworthy they looked by a separate group. Each standard unit increase of rating in ratings of attractiveness, dominance and trustworthiness on a sliding scale in our task uh, corresponded to increased pay of between uh, £100 to um, almost £300 in our task. When we asked individuals to rate these exact same um, faces um, as potential senior managers within retail rather than um, managers on the shop floor uh, within retail, uh, the value of facial attractiveness as it related to pay uh, decreased, the value of facial dominance and trustworthiness as it related to pay um, increased when judging senior managers compared to uh, shop floor managers. So these findings are interesting um, if they suggest that physical appearance might play at least some role um, in pay awards among two candidates who are judged to be otherwise equal on um, traits that are much more relevant to the, um, or skills or traits that are much more relevant uh, to the job at hand. So it might raise questions about the use of their photographs on CVs, for example, um, or um, it might be useful to remind um, employers uh, during uh, promotion rounds or hiring rounds uh, to, to use tasks that enable individuals to demonstrate their actual ability at a job rather than their uh, perceived ability, for example. So social judgments of others, research on social judgments of others can provide a window into our human nature as it relates to uh, cooperation and competition. I'd suggest that uh, this work might become more uh, rather than less uh, relevant in the future. There's some growing evidence uh, for partisanship, both on their political dimensions and cultural dimensions, uh, both online and um, in offline communities. Uh, places where birds of a feather really might stick together and your enemy's enemy might really uh, not be your friend whom you can find any kind of common ground with. We know uh, from research in the face literature that we can make judgments of faces such as how competent, intelligent, trustworthy or dominant they look uh, from very um, minimal exposure to these faces in these kinds of tasks. In some cases we can make judgments like competence from faces um, when looking at the faces of actual uh, past election candidates. 
Recent work suggests that these biases in how we might judge uh, leaders might be specific to so-called um, undecided voters rather than generalise across the population. But this is still really important if the undecided voter represents the so-called uh, swing voter, um, whom politicians are usually, um, at least in the UK to my knowledge, uh, quite keen to invest a lot of money toward getting them to swing from uh, one to the other during election campaigns. So excessive media focus on public persona and um, sound bites and political gaff making over much uh, stronger focus on um, uh, someone's policy and the, the substance of their argument um, represents a real problem um, if the media continue to focus on uh, debates in this way, uh, such as um, within election uh, debates on TV. Um, if these biases exist, and if these biases interact uh, with an increasingly um, politically tribal environment. And this is a problem regardless of whether or not you consider yourself to be on the left or the right of the political spectrum. So research on social judgments of others can provide a window into our human nature. Uh, we can use this um, research as a guide to at least remind ourselves to try to take time uh, to gain deeper insights into people's uh, lives and motivations. And to use this knowledge uh, to seek qualities in others uh, that help us to uh, gain diverse perspectives and worldviews uh, from the heroic to the intelligent to the more peaceable and friendly. Thank you.